Okay, so we'll start now. So this webinar is to talk about Oasis Primer, and uh, we're going to talk about version 14, so the new features that are in version 14, which has recently been released. So just a little bit about version history as a reminder. Uh, version 14 was released last month. And it's the first release of version 14, so it's called 14.0. Uh, the previous full release was version 13.1. And that was released in June of last year. So you're most likely, if you're using Primer, most likely using 13.1 at the minute. And version 14, um, hopefully you, you'll be able to start using it soon. So as I've said, this was released last month. So it's been out a few weeks. Um, it sometimes takes a while for it to get on the system uh, at the various places that use it, so hopefully you'll be able to use it soon. So first of all, I'll talk about keyword support. So the first thing to talk about is um, in, in version 14 of Primer, um, in terms of Elastana keywords, it supports everything up to and including R9. So that's across volumes 1, 2, and 3. Um, it also supports um, quite a few R10 keywords and fields. Um, these are generally things like control cards, contact cards, material cards, um, and uh, they're there if you want to um, try out some of the new features that are in R10. But everything up to and including R9 will be supported. So as I said, I'm just going to go through some of the new features that's in version 14 that you should be able to use when you when you get access to it. The first thing I want to talk about are labels. So if you use Primer, then you'll probably know that there are quite a few tools within Primer for uh, renumbering entities, um, managing uh, labels and IDs. So maybe you have some include files. There are tools for um, um, setting include ranges for each include file so that when you create an entity or in number entities within that include file, they'll get an appro appropriate um, ID. <clears throat> now, in version 14, we've added the ability to lock labels. So the idea here is there might be some entities in your model where you want to prevent a primer from changing the label. So maybe a, a standard renumbering operation. You don't want to renumber certain entities. Examples of this are things like database history nodes. Um, you might want to fix the labels of those. So when you're feeding into your post-processing, they're always the same. Other examples are maybe you connect together include files um, with rigid patches using constrained rigid bodies. And the part IDs on either side of the uh, constrained rigid body has to remain constant. So those are another example of something you might want to lock. So how does this work? Well, I've got some demos here. So I'll just switch into um, Primer. So hopefully you can see the Primer screen here. This is a model that currently does not in, um, include any of these locked labels. So to define them, you go to Renumber and then click on Locked Labels. And you get an empty panel that looks something like this. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. This is there so that you can um, define recipes for the labels that you want to lock in the model. So the idea here is that on the left-hand side here, you specify what you want to apply this to. So it could be the whole model, so in this case all. Or you can select an individual include file that you want to apply it to. And then you specify the type of entity you want to apply it to. And again, this could be all the entities in the model or in the include file. Or it can be a particular entity type, for example, shell or node or, or whatever it may be. And then you specify a minimum and maximum label range. So you might want to lock all shells in this include file between um, 1,000 and 1,200, for example. And you add this into the list, and you build up any number of these. And you can have any number per include file as well. And then Primer will use these to know what it can and can't renumber. <clears throat> now, you can use this table to specify everything. Um, but another thing you can do is read this information in via a CSV file. So if I just do that now, So 
So here I've read in some information from a CSV file. And as you can see, I've got all my include files on the left-hand side here. And my type is set to node. And then I've got label ranges for each, each node um, entity type within each include file. And what this is essentially saying is that for each include file, I've got a range of nodes that I want to remain fixed and locked. And this can be used as maybe the upper range of a uh, general include label range where you're specifying nodes, database history nodes, for example, where you want to always have a locked range. So if I apply that, let's say I do a, a general um, renumbering operation and primer. So here I'm going to renumber everything in the model sequentially from one. Okay. So I've done that. If I go into my uh, visualize panel, so this is where I can, um, uh, now one thing I haven't done, sorry, if I go to lock labels and apply that to the model. Let me just start again because I've done that slightly wrong. Let me read the model in again. Excuse me for that. Okay, so if I now go to renumber, lock labels, read that CSV file in again, and apply it to the model. Then do renumber contents, renumber everything sequentially from one, apply renumber, then go to visualize. So this is showing me all the labels that are currently being used in the model. As you can see, pretty much everything is sequentially from one. So here we've got all the entity types down the left-hand side and the labels along the top. Everything is, is pretty much sequentially from one. However, there are some um, black blocks up here in the, um, in the upper range. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'll zoom in. And for nodes, you can see there's some black blocks. Um, uh, in, in the upper label ranges. And that's because those labels are locked. So because of the locked label ranges that I've specified, those have not been renumbered when I asked Primer to renumber everything sequentially from one. Now there are various things you can do here. You can, um, you can add these on the fly. So if you click on a particular node to modify, you can right click on the node ID and say lock label. And that will add an entry into the list um, for that particular include file, that entity type, and the label range, the minimum and maximum the same for a single entity that you're adding in. Now, when you specify these things, if you write the model out of primer, they'll be saved as comments at the top of a file. Okay, and That means when you read the model back into primer, um, Primer will read those comments automatically and apply it in that in that subsequent uh, uh, Primer session. So I'll always take those into account. They'll be stored with the model. Now, if you're concerned about maybe um, losing those comments, perhaps you read your model into another preprocessor and those comments will be lost. What you can do is you can store that CSV file of information in a central area and um, have a preference that points towards it, and everyone has access to it. That means that whenever you start Primer and read a model in, it will use those locked label ranges on, on the model you have read in. Just to mention picking and selection. So this is just a couple of new methods for uh, picking and selecting nodes and shells. So in the standard selection menu, say you're um, doing an operation in Primer, for example, orient, you might want to orient some nodes. Um, in the selection panel under the viz options, there's, there's these new options. One is called path line and one is called path area. So with path line, um, as the diagram shows here, you click on two nodes, <coughs> excuse me, on a mesh and Primer will automatically work out the shortest distance along the mesh uh, between the two nodes that you've selected and will select all the nodes in between as well. Okay. Um, path area is pretty similar where you define a series of these path lines 
but Prime will automatically close off that path line to form um, a polygon and will select everything within that polygon automatically. So it's a fairly easy way of selecting nodes and elements um, on a mesh surface. I'm just going to talk a little bit about contacts. So there's been various updates to the contact penetration uh, checking panel, um, mainly to do with how you uh, view the information on the screen. So there's a, a new only button. Um, you can also filter what's shown in um, uh, the, uh, the the list of um, crossed edges and penetrations. You can also filter those as well. Um, what I really wanted to show you is, is when you're manually fixing some of these penetrations, there's a couple of new options which are really useful. And these are the local normals and depenetration vectors. So previously, if you were um, fixing some uh, penetrations in Primer, you would select the nodes that you want to fix. You'd specify a vector you want to move them along. And that vector can be either normal to a shell, or it might be node one to node two, or even define the vector itself. Then you'd move all the nodes in that direction. Now, these new options, local normals and depenetration vectors, um, are a way of moving the selected nodes all in independent directions. And I'll show you this in a demo, because it's easier to explain. So if I just bring up a primer again. So here we have a very simple model. You can see there's a red part and a green part. And uh, the red part is penetrating into the green part. So if I do contact, penetration check, and I contour those, you can see we do have some penetrations in there. So if I now go to fix those penetrations, I'm going to add nodes to fix. So this is where I select the nodes that I want to uh, move. I'm going to select some nodes along a free edge here. Now, I'm now in the new local normals mode. Um, so hopefully you can see there's now some arrows pointing in the, in the local normal direction for that node. And that's the direction that we'll, the node will move in. So I can type in a distance here. But what's probably more useful is the drag option where I can um, drag those nodes to remove those penetrations. If I just leave some back in there, there's also one new option in here which is quite useful, which is this drag one at a time. So if I click on that, I can now just click on the nodes and drag them in the normal direction and remove those penetrations quite easily. So quite a, quite a useful new tool for when you're locally fixing um, uh, some, some penetrations in your model. Okay. Um, another thing we've improved in version 14 is the contact part uh, view. So, so what this is, if you're not familiar with it, is if you go to contact and you click on the part button, you select um, a part or a number of parts, and then you ask Primer to tell you information about which contacts those parts are in. And this takes into account all the different part sets that you can use. So you might be using um, uh, star part generate. You might be using um, intersect or add or whatever it may be, uh, set collect. And it also takes into account, um, uh, it also takes into account um, uh, boxes and so on. So it knows if a part is in a contact or not. Yeah. So. Um, this was in version 13, and what Primer would give is it would give a, a text box with that information in there. What we did in version 14 is we've added the, a tree view, like, like the one shown in this P1 
picture here. And this makes it much more easier to, to investigate this information, um, to uh, interactively edit the contact, uh, just visualize what's in the contact, and all that sort of stuff. Something else we've added into the contact panel is the ability to write contact information directly to an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so in version 13, we had the ability to write part information directly to an Excel spreadsheet. So you can um, select parts on the part table and then write that to a spreadsheet and it would embed images of those parts in the spreadsheet. So we've done the same thing with contacts. So if I go back into um, Primer, and go to contact. So in this model, there's around 20 contacts, um, actually 17 contacts. And if I go to contact right, okay, and I um, uh, specify a file to write this out to, so I'll just, I'll go to contact output 14, Right all. Now hopefully you can see in the top left hand corner of Primer, it's looping through the contacts and showing you the contents of those contacts in the in the small image. And it's producing some images that it's then going to write into the Excel file. Just takes a few seconds. Um, I'm just going to read another model in ready for the next demo. So if I now open up this file that's been produced, this is the file that's been produced. So we have one row per uh, contact. Um, there's the card name, there's a the title, and then this is the images. So we have a combined image. And if I scroll down a bit, it's probably best shown in this bottom row. This is the combined image. So it's showing everything that's on the slave side and the master side okay and then here we see separate images for what's on the slave side and what's on the master side so you can see and um, we have the belt on one side of the contact and then the occupant and the seat on the other side of the contact now, there's also other contact information written to this file so you can see here we've got the uh, friction values we've got soft values um, ignore values, and then we've got a summary of the penetrations related to that particular contact. So we've got number of penetrating nodes, number of crossed edges, max penetration, and so on. Okay. So I'm just going to move on to connections now. Um, if you're not familiar with the connections tools in Primer, the connection tools allows easy creation and management of various connection types. So we're talking here spot welds, bolts, and adhesive. Um, Primer connections allow you to easily uh, modify and remake multiple connections in one go, and read various file types and create connections automatically. Um, you can check that the mesh independent connections are attached via tie contacts. And you can use scripting to create and modify connections in more complex ways if you wish to. So you can uh, change the properties of connections to suit the number of panels you're joined together, the grade of the panels, all that sort of stuff. So um, what have we changed in version 14? Well, one thing is that previously, so in version 13, uh, uh, when you create a connection, there are various settings that are used that you can change when creating that connection that could determine whether the connection is made or not. So one example is there's a maximum length of spot weld. And if you have that um, set to a particular value, the connection might not make because the panels are too far apart. So you might change that setting to allow the connection to, to make successfully. Now, if you then um, 
uh, created the model, wrote it out, came out of Primer, opened up Primer at a later date, and then remade um, that connection. It might not remake because the settings have reverted back to the default. Or you might have passed that um, file onto someone else and their settings are a little bit different as well. And you re remake the connection um, and it doesn't make entirely as it did before. So that was, this was a bit of a problem. And this feeds into other tools like um, um, part replace. When you do a part replace, sometimes that can automatically remake connections. And sometimes you would find that the connections wouldn't make because of this issue. So what we've done in version 14 is that when uh, when you make a connection, Primer automatically saves all the connection settings that were used to create that connection with that connection. Okay. Um, that means that when you remake the connection in the future, it will uh, automatically reuse all those settings that you have saved with the connection, and it makes it much more likely that the connection will remake in the same way it did um, uh, the next time. Now moving on, um, spot weld remeshing. Um, so in version 13, if you're creating, say, a solid spot weld like the one on the screen, that's a mesh independent spot weld, uh, projects the nodes to the surface, and then you create a tied contact to tie that onto the surface. What we've done in version 14 is to um, have the option to remesh locally the surrounding area, the panels that are being joined together, so that the spot weld is meshed in. Okay, and then optionally on top of that, you can specify a ring, or so a heat affected zone, or a number of heat affected zones around that. So Primer will mesh those in, um, and then you can assign material properties to those. So I've just got a demo of this. Here we've got um, a, a, a simple B pillar, and at the minute in this model, if I just rotate it around, and blank this panel, hopefully you can see we've got some spot welds in here, and they're single solid spot welds at the minute. So if I go to connection um, table, what I'm going to do is try to convert one of these single solid spot welds into a multi-solid spot well, but one that's meshed into the panels. And you can do this via the connections table. So the connections table gives you access to connection properties and allows you to modify those connection properties. So on here, if I change this from a single solid type to a four solid type, and if I also turn on some of the remesh options. I'll explain these um, when I change them. So first of all, do we want to remesh the panels? At the minute it's set to no, so I'll change that to, to a yes. Then the remesh diameter. So this is the sort of field of influence. How, how much do you want to remesh um, these panels away from the spot well? So let's just set this to 50 millimeters. Number of rings, so I'm going to set that to be one ring around the spot weld. And then the diameter of that ring, so I'll set that to be 10 millimeters. And then the part ID of that ring, so I'll just set that to 1,000. And if I update and remake that connection, remakes it. And if I zoom in, hopefully you can see that um, this spot weld has, has been remade as a four solid spot weld. It's now been meshed into the panel. It's remeshed the panels that it's joining together. And also we've got a heat affected zone ring that's been modeled around that spot weld. And that's been given a particular part ID. Now, something that goes alongside this, if I just switch to a different model, here we have uh, a very simple model of a series of plates. And if I just look at the side view, it might be difficult for you to see, but on the left-hand side here, we've got three panels. But on the right-hand side here, we've got two panels. And we're going to create some spot welds here that join these panels together. So on the left-hand side, we're going to create a 3T spot welds. On the right-hand side, we're going to create 2T spot welds. So if I go to Connection Create, 
Now in the Spotwell creation panel, there's now this new um, remesh option. This is turned on now here. And this means I want to remesh the panels when I create my spot weld. And there's various options you can specify here. So there's the diameter to remesh, uh, number of rings, um, the diameter of the ring, the part ID of the ring, and so on. But you can imagine that um, depending on which panels you're joining together, how many panels you're joining together, um, the grade of material you're joining together, diameter of the spot weld, you will want to vary um, the material ID and therefore the part ID of the heat affected zone that you're creating. Okay. Now the way you can do that is you can either put in the information here or we've got this concept of rules. Okay. So you can specify a rule in here. Now these are just some examples that are given out with primer, these, these rules here, but you can create any rule that you want. And these are written in primer's JavaScript language. And the idea here is you can have a company specific rule for how you assign the material properties and diameter and part ID of these heat affected zones, depending on um, what you're joining together, how many panels you're joining together, and what material of those, that those panels you're, you're joining together. Um, so a very simple example here is my number of layers. So this is, this is a rule that says if we're joining together um, three panels, then you have uh, a heat affected zone of a particular diameter and a particular part ID. And it says if you're joining together two panels, you have a spot weld with a heat affected zone with a different diameter and a different part ID. So if I now go ahead and start creating some of these spot welds, hopefully you can see that on the left hand side here, we have a heat affected zone which is a blue part Whereas on the right hand side here, we've got an orange part. So that's a different part ID. And it's also slightly bigger. And that's because on the left, on the right hand side, we're creating two T welds. On the left hand side, we're creating uh, three T welds. And you can also vary this as it goes through the connection as well. So for each different layer, you can have a different part ID and diameter for the heat affected zone. So hopefully this gives you complete control over um, heat, heat affected zones and how they are, um, how you can create them with your spot welds. So I'll talk a little bit about mass. So there's been various updates to mass features within Primer. Um, we've added the ability to set part masses using star element mass part via the bill of materials feature. Um, you can also do this via the assign mass tool as well. So assign mass tool is used to set mass properties for a particular group of parts. And previously that worked by using star element mass, so just the nodal masses. Um, but now it, it works by, you can also do it by a, a star element mass part as well. And there's various new options for contouring these mass values. So let me just show you this as a very quick example. So I've got a model here in Primer. And if I just show you first, if I go to element tab, Hopefully you can see that if you go down to element mass part, there's no element mass part definitions in this model at the minute. So if I go to bill of materials and click read, and then I'm going to select a CSV file. So for those of you who haven't used the bill of materials uh, feature before, this is a way of importing a CSV file of part information and applying that information to your model. So you might have a CSV file which contains you know, a list of parts and what thickness you want those parts to be or what, uh, how many number of integration points you want for each part. And that could, you can apply that to your model. The new thing in version 14 is the ability to set mass via this. So you can set a target mass in this panel and apply it to your model. So I'm just applying that to the model, and if I go to element, hopefully you can now see there's now 46 element mass part definitions being created. And I can now contour these as well. So if I go to mass properties and contour those, these are the masses 
that have been set by a star element mass part. So if you're interested in using star element mass part in your models as a way of defining what you want the target mass of parts to be within your crash models, then this is a way, uh, a very simple way of, of doing it. Now I also mentioned you can do this um, via assign mass. So if I just go to assign mass and create. So assign mass, as I said before, is a way, it's been in Primer for a while, assign mass, but it's a way of um, defining mass properties of a group of, a group of parts. So the idea here is you can set either the total mass, what you want the total mass of these parts to be, or you can specify an amount of mass that you want to add, um, or you can um, uh, uh, you can change the C of G by a small amount. Um, you might want to change the X coordinate of the C of G by a small amount. Primer then calculates how it needs to distribute mass across that those parts, and um, and then um, and then um, uh, creates the cards, the appropriate cards for the model. Now, before in previous versions, you would uh, it would do this by creating nodal masses, so star element mass, and for every node in the parts that you have selected as you want to apply this mass to, it will spread the the mass over those nodes um, to reach the targets that you have specified. But you can now do this using um, part masses as well. So it will create or modify or delete star element mass part definitions that you have in your model um, uh, to achieve the targets you have specified. So as I've said, you can set the, to the total mass, but you can also change the C of G or the inertia properties. Okay, but, it's, but you can do it now do it by um, um, parts rather than just relying on the nodal masses. Um, okay, so just talking about parameters. So here we're talking about star parameters and star parameter um, expressions. Um, so you can read these into Primer, and you have been able to do that for a number of versions. But um, what we found is people have started using many, many thousands of parameters in some models, and many, many thousands of parameter expressions in some models. And um, this could be slow to read and evaluate and, uh, and access the data within Primer. So we put in quite a lot of effort in, into speeding that up. So if you do work with lots and lots of parameters, then you should find version 14 a lot quicker than version 13. We've also got improved handling of implied parameters. So this is this syntax. So if you didn't know, instead of creating a star parameter expression card, you can just type in uh, simple expressions into the field um, of a particular value. So here you can see a nodal coordinate. You can type scale times uh, 2.5 in this in this way, and uh, Dyna will um, evaluate that. <clears throat> We've also added support for the LSOPT expression syntax, which looks something like this, and. Also, we've added a new check for parameter names which are legal in, in LS Diner. So there are a few parameters that parameter names that can cause problems if you use them, uh, because they are used internally within our LS Diner. So we put in a new check for that. So if you do work with many, many thousands of parameters in your model, this is the panel that you'll, you'd use to um, modify and edit uh, parameter information. And if you did have many thousands, it could be difficult to find. The, the right parameter in there. So in version 14, we've added filtering options and sorting options into this panel. <clears throat> so hopefully it makes it a lot easier to work with that many parameters. Um, moving on to some of the load care setup tools that we have. So um, in Primer, there's a tool for setting up interior head impact, so FMVSS 201 upper automatically calculates the target points based on the regulation and the selections that you make in the panel. This has been in Primer for a while, but we've added in the ability to create robustness points 
around each target point and essentially creates a cluster of target uh, impact points. This then feeds into the automatic build part of Primer where it will automatically position the head from all of these points, um, depenetrate and then write out um, uh, the required input decks and create the required include transforms to move your impactor to the various target positions. Now one other thing we've added into version 14 is a HIC area tool. So this is aimed towards pedestrian impact analysis. And the idea here is that you can you can read some uh, HIC values into Primer, visualize them in the model, and uh, uh, and look at the data in, in, in different ways. And I'll just show you this as an example. So here we have our vehicle model again. And if I go to safety, pedestrian, HIC area calculator. And if I read a file in, so this is just reading in a CSV file, okay? And the CSV file contains XYZ coordinates and a HIC value. And here, hopefully, you can see that Primer has created um, a, a blob, um, a, a colored blob in there to represent um, that HIC value. Now, on this panel, um, we've got a low HIC value of 1,000 and a high HIC value of 1,700. Um, so that means that everything that you see that's green um, is below 1,000. Everything that's above 1,700 is red, and everything in between is the orange color. Um, and you can change those values as well. Now, you can hopefully see a black line around the outer edge of these points. The prime has automatically worked out what uh, a suitable outer boundary of these points is. And because that's quite arbitrary, you can, you can tighten that or slacken that as you see fit. Hopefully, you can see those lines moving. Now, optionally as well, you can read a perimeter file. So this is just a CSV file. If you already have the perimeter that you want to use, you can optionally read that in as well. So the idea here is I click on Calculate Area, and it interpolates between all the points that I have here and works out some areas and gives me a contour plot. So it projects it down to a flat surface because that's what happens in reality. But what I can do is project this to the bonnet surface because it's quite often easier to visualize it in that way. So here we go. Hopefully you can see now that I've got a contour plot of HIC. And this is just showing tricolor. So at the minute it's showing the areas which is under 1,000 and the areas which are over 1,700 and the orange areas are have HIC values in between. I can turn off the tricolor plot and you just see a normal sort of contour plot of HIC. <clears throat> So what this is telling me that is that 87.3% of the impact area is green. Okay. Um, now there's other things you can do in this panel as well. So what you might be interested in is you might be interested in a, a sensitivity study on the areas. So what you can do is a button here called sensitivity study. If I click on that, uh, and what this does is it you specify a value that you want to add or take off each of the HIC values that you read in. And Primer will recalculate the effect that has on the area. So here the default is 50, so taking 50 off the HIC value. So I'll do that. And you get a different contour plot, which highlights the areas that you might want to look at first when thinking about design changes to your model. Um, to try and maximize the effect of increasing the area that's green. So this is telling me that um, if I wanted to increase the area that's green, um, uh, the 87 percent, I want to look at these areas above the headlamps and maybe these couple of areas at the back. So it's quite a useful tool for doing some simple um, sensitivity studies. Now, also as well, if you did change something over the headlamp, what you might want to do is just rerun um, a set um, amount of, of impacts above the headlamp. You wouldn't necessarily run all the impact points across the bonnet again. And so there are tools in here for um, combining a subset um, uh, reanalysis with, with the current analysis you already have in there.
Okay. Okay, I'll move on now and talk about um, measure. So measure is, uh, the measure tools have been in Primer for a while, but there's a new option in there. Uh, and this is a distance plotter. So it's a way of um, plotting as a contour distance between um, two groups of parts. And you specify a vector to do that along. And this again is best described or shown as a as a demo. So I'll switch back into Primer. And if I just have a look at the floor and the fuel tank in this model. And one point to note here is that if I just blank the floor, there's a big hole in this fuel tank model. Um, and this will be shown up when I do this uh, this distance plot. So if I go into the measure panel, click on distance plot, I measure from, so I select the floor, and I measure to the fuel tank. And um, the current vector is along the uh, negative Z direction, so I'll leave it as that. If I just click on calculate, I get a contour plot that looks like this. And hopefully you can see there, you can see the distance between the floor and the fuel tank below. And um, uh, you can see where the hole is. So the values are higher where uh, the floor is looking through the hole um, to the lower surface of the fuel tank. And there's various things you can do in this panel. You can change uh, in terms of contours. You can change the maximum minimum value. You can reverse the colors. You can turn um, certain contours on or off and, and so on. Now, if I just quit out of here, there are some other tools related to this distance plotter related to pedestrian impact I'll just mention. So I'm just going to read in a properties file. Now, a properties file is just a way of storing um, uh, view and blanking information. So if I just go to uh, this one read file. So this is the same model, but we're just looking at the bonnet and some components beneath the bonnet. So if I go to measure distance plot, I'm going to measure from the bonnet, measure to all of the visible parts. And um, I'm going to change my vector so at the minute it's in the negative Z direction. So I'm going to rotate that around Y by 30 degrees. And the reason is I want to take into account the line of flight of the head form because I'm thinking about pedestrian impact here. So if I click on calculate, you get a contour plot that looks something like this of distance beneath the bonnet to the various components that are beneath there. So that's quite useful when thinking about pedestrian impact. You can look at the components that are too close or, or where you have um, um, space underneath the bonnet that you want. But what you might have is a sort of clearance zone beneath the bonnet. And you might want to look at just, just look at things that are within a particular clearance. And you can do that because the clearance input in here. So let's say I wanted to look at um, things that are beneath the bonnet. Um, and within 60 millimeters, okay? So let's type in 60 millimeters here. What this essentially does is apply an offset to the values that you've got calculated. So now, if I set my maximum value to be zero, that means that anything that's negative will, um, will be within the clearance zone beneath my bonnet. So if I just turn off the, the blue values here, hopefully you can now just see the highlighted areas this is showing me where there is something beneath the bonnet along the line of flight that is within 60 millimeters of the bonnet surface. So these are potentially areas which might be problematic if I'm thinking about pedestrian impact. Now, one other thing you can do on here as well, there's display as area option, which will look at the bonnet surface and look at the contour values we have here and tell me what percentage of the area beneath the bonnet along the line of flight um, uh, interferes with that clearance zone of 60 millimeters. 
Now there's also an affected zone distance you, you can do here as well. So you can imagine that, yes, if you hit on one of these contoured areas where we um, have something beneath the bonnet, that that will affect the hick value. But if you just hit to the side of it as well, that will probably be affected by what's beneath the bonnet. So you can enter an affected zone distance here, and a, a distance here that might be an appropriate one to use for pedestrian head impact is maybe half the head form's diameter. So if I type in 82.5 here for half the head form's diameter, click OK, we get something that looks like this. So here you can see the red areas are the areas where we've got something beneath the bonnet which is within 60 millimeters of the bonnet surface. And then the orange areas are just growing that red area out by 82 and a half millimeters to show you what area might be affected by what's beneath the bonnet in those areas. And I get percentage values here. So you can see that 1.6% of my bonnet area is red, but actually the affected um, area is maybe 24, you know, a quarter of the bonnet. So it's a very simple way of doing some geometric studies. Perhaps you might get a new bonnet surface and you want to assess, assess that very quickly um, with the previous model without having to run lots of LS Dyna analyses. You can do some very quick quick geometric assessments using this tool. Just a little bit about scripting. So um, if you didn't know, you can, you can write um, scripts in Primer and all of our software. Um, and it's based around JavaScript. And the advantage of writing a script is you can you can write your own capabilities quite easily. Uh, and the advantages of doing that is that it's a quick turnaround. You don't have to wait for a new version of our software to be released before you get a new tool. And you can completely keep it completely confidential and it's under your control and you can do with it, do whatever you wish with it. Um, some example applications in Primer are creating simple meshes or test models with standard loading, um, data checking or correcting. Uh, geometric morphing functions um, you can use it for. It's quite useful for uh, input and output translators. So um, you know, there might be a particular file format, perhaps with connections, for example, which Primer doesn't natively read. Um, and you can quite easily write a script that will grab the information from that file and create connections automatically in your model. And also automating routine tasks. So maybe there's something you find yourself doing again, again, again. Um, you can use scripting to automate that. So I'm not going to go into any detail on these, but basically we've expanded the um, the the API for the JavaScript interface. Um, so you've got more access to um, Dyna keywords and modifying and creating uh, Dyna keywords than you had before. And you've also got lots more access to various different tools and functions um, available in Primer. So, for example, here you've got access to the label locking um, functionality that I talked about earlier on. Um, you've got access to uh, measurements between two parts, the minimum distance between two parts. You've got direct access to that um, from JavaScript. Now, this is interesting. So I, I showed earlier how you can write out contact information directly to an Excel spreadsheet. Now, we've added the ability to write any information from your model at all and any image from your model um, directly to a spreadsheet by creating a simple script. And the simple script might look something like this. And you can see that you're just adding text or images quite simply um, to a spreadsheet at a particular uh, row and column location. So this allows you to write any sort of information you want to a spreadsheet. And I've got a very simple example here. If I go to Primer, um, slightly different model actually, I'll go to this model. In this model, I've got some database uh, cross sections. So if I go to script, I've got a script here that I'm going to run. And I'll explain what it is after I run it. But hopefully you can see that Prime has made a small window in the top left again, and it's creating some images 
And what it's creating is some images of some database cross sections in the model, and also um, grabbing out properties of those cross sections. So if you didn't know, if I go to database cross section and if I modify one of the cross sections in the model, on the edit panel you can click on properties, and that gives you a panel that looks something like this, which calculates various different um, elastic, plastic um, properties related to that cross section. So you can get you have access to these properties via JavaScript, and that means if I just this is the file that was written out of Primer when I ran that script. You can see that it's an Excel spreadsheet. Each row represents um, a, a different database cross section. I've created a few images of that cross section, which parts it's cutting through, and so on. Then we've got a whole list of properties related to that cross-section. So we've got IXX, IYY, and so on. So, and that's a very simple script to create. So hopefully it shows you that you can create a script that will, um, that will, um, uh, you can create a script that can contain any information in your model at all, and any image um, quite easily. Also with Primer, um, we release a few examples uh, scripts. So one such script is a, a very simple design of experiments script. And the idea here is that you have a CSV file of information. So here we've got an example of one. And we've got 26 rows on here, uh, various different values. And these are different values that you want to apply to your model in different ways. Um, and the way it works is you have a template file that looks something like this on the left and you have special comments which say where you want to grab the information from in uh, the, the CSV file. So here you can see the columns B, C, and D. It's going to grab the information from columns B, C, and D and create parameters of the column header names with the particular value. So um, for column B, uh, run 1 will get a, a, a parameter of this name with value 10. Run two, we'll get a value of the same name volumes uh, with a value of zero and so on. And also down here you can see column E from D of E, and we've got XXX in this headlamp name. Um, that will just be substituted by the version of the headlamp as specified in column E. So it's just a simple way of doing text substitution to create um, many, many models um, in, in an easy way. Now, if you are interested in scripting, um, one uh, one thing you can do now is use Visual Studio and Telesense. So with version 14, there comes a little file and a document that explains how to do this. But essentially, it means that you can use Visual Studio to write JavaScripts, and it will know all the functions and arguments that are available to you from the API. And it means you don't have to refer to the JavaScript manual all the time. It makes it much, much easier to write scripts. A few miscellaneous things. Um, there's a new general node import function. Uh, this allows you to uh, just import nodes from one model to another, um, uh, nodal coordinate information. Um, in the finds panel, there was the ability to um, put a volume around a particular entity and see what just see what's in that volume. That's useful for small things in a big model, but when looking at large items, for example, this roof panel here, you want to see what's within a particular distance of the, or the whole surface. So there's a new surface option in Find, which allows you to do that. In Mesh Tools, there's a simple, um, uh, there's a test mesher in there, so it's quite easy now to simply create a test mesh from, from surface information you have in your model. And also, this one's a bit hard to explain, but essentially, people wanted to be able to create a sub-model from just what's visible on the screen. And you could do this before by using the clipboard and putting all your entities onto the clipboard and, and then writing that as a separate model. But you wouldn't necessarily get everything you want. You wouldn't get control cards, for example. So this is now a, a much more robust way of creating um, a sub-model from, from just what's visible on the screen. In, uh, in seat belts, there's a new way for moving the control points that you uh, create 
uh, when fitting a belt to previously use the left, the middle and the right mouse button to, to move your control points in global X, Y and Z. Uh, but there's now a way of dragging those points um, in the normal direction to the occupant and it's a much more natural way of moving your belt away or towards the occupant. We've also changed the, um, when you're creating a seat belt, we also change the panel for how you define the ends of the seat belt and what's in the middle of the seat belt. So previously, for example, you couldn't create a combination of 1D and 2D seat belt elements. You can do that now. You can create any combination of 1D, 2D uh, seat belt elements and shell elements. And also this panel will highlight if you're going to try introduce errors into your model. So for example, one end of the seat belt, you might have a slip ring and you don't want to have shell elements going into the slip ring. And also for seat belts, there's a general save button that will save all the settings that you have um, changed potentially when fitting a seat belt, because you often have to change these settings. There's a general save button there. Um, that saves everything to your preferences. So next time you come into Primer, you don't have to save all those settings again. So I'm going to finish today by talking about checking. So model checking continues to be an integral part of Primer. Um, there's around 400 new checks added into version 14 compared to version 13. And now overall, there's, there's around 7,000 7, checks within Primer. So what have we changed in version 14. Well, one thing is, um, if you go to check, we've always had this element quality uh, button under the check panel. But if I just turn on my element quality checks and click on element quality, what that does is just does a normal sort of primer model check, but just the element quality part of it. And you get a panel that looks like this, where you see a list of all the um, elements that fail the criteria that you have set. Um, but we had various tools in Primer for viewing those and fixing those, and we've added links to those from this panel. So it's easier to investigate these things in one place. So one thing in the top right-hand corner here is we have quality imperfection. So this is kind of an overall contour view of the quality of your elements. So it, it brings together all the quality criteria that you've set and, and calculates an overall value. And the higher the value, the worse the element is. What's maybe more useful is the failed criteria button, and that will just contour the elements that have failed any criteria that you have set. So hopefully you can see here that I've got some blue elements on my mesh, and these are failing my Jacobian um, quality criteria. And then finally, we've got a link to the no drag panel. Again, this has been in Primer for a while, but you can get it directly from this panel now, and that means you can drag um, the elements that the nodes on the surface of the mesh to to fix those quality issues. Now, one other thing we've added into version 14 is um, one one common operation is you will maybe run your model in Airsteiner, you'll initialize your model in Airsteiner, and there might be some problems. It might fall over. There might be some errors and warnings that are given in the standard output files from Airsteiner, D3 HSP file or message file or log files. And you have to open up the file in a text editor. You have to find the errors and warnings. You have to write down the ID of an entity, for example, and you have to come back into Primer, find that entity, and investigate what the problem might be and fix it. So we've added something that will hopefully speed up that process. So if you go to check now, there's now a Dyna output button. If I click on that, what that does is for a particular directory, it will look through all the output files that are in there and then scan through them, looking for errors and warnings and, um, and listing them in the tree view here. So this is all the errors and warnings that are within this model uh, when after you've initialized it in LS Diner. And as you can see here, um, Primer knows when a particular error or warning relates to a particular entity type. And that means that I can then quite easily see a list of the elements that have triggered this particular error or warning in Diner, and I can investigate them. So I can right click on them and, and do, do only. I can have a look at a particular part directly and and investigate and maybe fix the problems that I have with the model. 
So it's quite a useful way of looking at all the errors and warnings that are, are, are spat out by LS Diner and visualizing them directly within um, Primer. Now, alongside that, because we've now got different sources of information for all our errors and warnings, we've got the Diner output check, we've got a normal Primer check, we maybe just want to consider element quality. We've added in something called a dashboard check. And what this does is it, it's intended to give you an overall view on the quality of your model as it stands. So I'll just, I'll just set it running and then explain more about what it is. So you have a panel and at the top it's got some standard information that tells you the date, it tells you what the model is, where it lives, um, if there's any preference files that were uh, read in when creating, uh, when starting this primer session. And then there's a series of, of boxes, which as you can see now, are given different colors. So if we look at the top three on the screen here, so the first one is element quality check. So that just does an element quality check. Um, and, um, uh, and if we find any problems, then it will, it will be an orange color. If everything's great in your model, then it will be green. Um, the middle one here is a model check. So that's a standard primer model check. Uh, if we find some errors in your model, it will be red. If there's no errors, but there are some warnings, it will be orange. If everything's clean, then it'll be green. The next one is the Dyna output check. So that is um, uh, the, what I've just shown you. So it scans through all the output files if you've initialized this in LS Dyna. So um, it scans through the uh, D3HSP file, the message files, and looks for all errors and warnings. So if you have any errors, this will come up as red. If it's just got warnings in, it will come up as orange, as shown in this example. If you don't have any errors and warnings, then it will be green. Now, the other slot uh, boxes in here, these are ones that um, I've added in, and you can add in as, as many or as few of these as you want. So these are intended to be uh, more company-specific errors and warning uh, uh, checks, really. And these are, again, small scripts that um, are written in Primer's JavaScript language that live in a particular area on the system that everyone has access to, but it allows you to write small checks and you can return whether these buttons should be um, red, orange, or green, and also what text should be displayed on this panel. So I'll just show you some examples of these that I've got in this model. So this is a model metrics one. So what this is, does is it looks at the model mass and looks at maybe the minimum time step um, the added mass in your model and checks against particular target values. And then we'll color this box red, green, or orange, depending on um, whether it's uh, within the target values or not. This middle one here, which says control cards, this checks to see if control cards meet company guidelines. So you might have some um, control card um, uh, guidelines that you always work to. You might always want to um, uh, set always have particular control cards in your model, particular fields on control cards you might always want to, want to set to a particular value. So this is a, that's not something that you can really um, check as a general uh, diner check. It's more company specific thing. So it's quite easy to create a little script that will check to make sure that you're following your own guidelines and will highlight it here. You can make it go orange or red if something is not quite right. This one here, element, formulation check, checks to see if we have any type 16 parts with number of integration points less than five. So this might be a particular modeling guideline that you always work to, and you can check the model to see if it passes that or not. And here you can see it says 145 problem parts. I can click on details here and it lists all the parts that have, have that problem. And there's various other ones down in here as well. And as I said, this is des designed so that you can add any number of these or you don't have to add any at all if you don't want to. Um, but they can live as a, in the central location that everyone has access to. It means that everyone can check the same things in the model and do it in a consistent way. OK, that has brought me to the end of the webinar today. Um, as I said, these will be uh, made available, uh, the slides and the uh, video of this uh, webinar will be made available um, in the future. And if you do have any questions, um, 
uh, one place to look is the our website arab.com slash diner or if you email diner.support at arab.com um, for any questions or comments that you might have um, or your local distributor.